David Olds is Professor of Pediatric Psychiatry, Preventative Medicine and Nursing, and he is the Director of the Prevention Research Center for Family and Child Health at the University of Colorado in Denver. He has focused his career on developing and testing a program of prenatal and infancy home visiting by nurses for low-income mothers and their children, known as the Nurse Family Partnership. Professor Old spent 20 years developing and testing the, the Nurse Family Partnership in a series of randomized clinical trials before offering it for public investment in 1996 under an initiative sponsored by the U.S. Justice Department. He has won many honors, including the Stockholm Prize in Criminology in 20, uh, 2009. Uh, just to take one section from the award citation, Dr. Old's work is recognized as much for applying knowledge to prevent crime as for his developing that knowledge. He has, since his initial work was published two decades ago, he has led a nationwide partnership in the U.S. with those cities agreeing to implement the exact protocol that has been found to be effective. Independent analysts of his work estimate that his program has saved seven times as much money as it costs to implement. So please welcome Professor David Olds. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Paul, for inviting me here and this is really a wonderful opportunity to um, reconnect with many of my uh, long-standing colleagues to address an issue that is of enormous public health importance. I think everybody here recognizes that we, as a society, as human beings, need to address the terrible, terrible uh, growth of, of, of violence often Almost, you, almost always perpetrated by males across the globe. So we need to both understand its origins, but also work quickly to use what we know to address what is really a growing problem. I am, um, I got involved, and in, let, let me just take a second to review for you the kinds of things I'd like to talk with you about today. I'm going to take a moment to talk about the, the theoretical and uh, epidemiologic foundations of the Nurse Family Partnership, to look at its evidentiary foundations, uh, to analyze our approach to national and international replication, to take a moment to think about the work we're doing to improve it, because this work will always be a work in progress. and. What we are beginning to see is that there are differences between males and females in program effects, and we want to understand better what may be accounting for this. Um, I personally got involved in this work in 1970 when I finished up undergraduate school in Baltimore and went to work at a daycare, inner city daycare center in West, uh, West Baltimore on West Lombard Street. Now, I had worked with Mary Ainsworth, uh, who's one of the leading sort of um, proponents of uh, at least developing the empirical foundations for attachment theory uh, while an undergraduate student. Um, and I was also a product of the 60s. I thought that if I could just help poor preschoolers get off to a good start, that they'd have a better chance of succeeding in elementary school and later on in society. But I soon realized that for many of the children in my classroom, it was already too little and too, too late. One little boy in my classroom couldn't speak. He, would, he could gesture, and he had compromised functioning. And it turns out that his mother was a drug addict and a, um, an alcoholic and abandoned his, her child to friends in the drug culture and he was being taken care of by a really heroic grandmother. Now, I want to emphasize that this 
slide. This picture shows me with an African-American boy, but at least half of the children in my classroom were white. And I think it's important for us to keep that in mind because, for example, this young child I was just describing was white. They came from West, West Virginia, moved to the west side of Baltimore looking for a better life. And um, so I'm not, in discussing the ca these cases, I'm not going to be dis uh, characterizing a particular um, race, but I am going to be talking about the conditions of poverty. Another little boy in my, in my classroom couldn't sleep at nap time. And it turns out they couldn't sleep because when he slept, he wet himself. And if he wet himself, his mom beat him. So it was safer for him not to sleep at all. Um, another, I've witnessed children being slapped across the face and literally pushed in the front door of the, um, of the daycare center. Uh, this is before there were any uh, child abuse and neglect reporting laws in our society. Um, one day, I, um, I took the kids down to a, I had a special session for the kids and I naively asked them, I said, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And this one little boy in the classroom said, speaking for the entire group, is we want to be cops. And I said, really, how come? He said, the cops got the guns. I realized that, um, um, that so much was going on that I also organized, with parents, honestly, and so I organized parent group meetings for children uh, in the classroom, uh, for parents to come in while ch children were napping. And it was the parents of children I was least concerned about who showed up. The parents I was most concerned, the children I was most concerned about, their parents I never saw. And it's so easy in some ways to point to parents as the, being the, the, um, the origins of all of this. But if you stepped outside of the, the door in our center, this picture is a picture of a little grocery store from inner city Baltimore. It looks exactly like this, the, um, the grocery store that was kitty corner from our center. And you know, we talked in 1970 about the importance of eating healthy diets. But if you went for miles around our center, there were no supermarkets with fresh, with fresh fruits and vegetables. The rates of unemployment were off the charts. The housing stock was terrible. The park I would take children to was filled with needles and alcoholics. Uh, the rates of crime were off the charts. So it's in those kinds of uh, contexts that it's not just a matter of parenting, but it's a matter of how one protects oneself as a parent living in those kinds of terrible circumstances. We need to keep that in mind, I think. Um, so eventually I went to work, I went to graduate school at, and worked with um, Yuri Bronfenbrenner. Some of you may know the name Yuri Bronfenbrenner. He did all the work on human ecology that was looking at both material and social determinants of um, child development. And Jay Belsky and I were graduate students. We overlapped, and Jerry worked on this study, this, this early study that we developed in Elmira, New York, to test the impact of a program of prenatal and infant and toddler home visiting by nurses for low-income mothers having their first babies. Now, we focused on that segment of the population because poverty concentrates risk. And Women going through their first pregnancies are going through major role changes, uh, which we thought was most important at the time uh, because that creates a sense of vulnerability on the part of women going through this experience, which makes them more receptive to offers of help. But we also now know that there are massive neuroendocrine changes going on in women's brains that have a a major effect on their acquiring their evolutionarily driven mandate to protect their, their offspring. Um, there is, we think that the program has, um, has had enduring effects. 
replicated effects, in part because we've, been, we've tried to be clear about what exactly it is we're, we're trying to accomplish and how we're going to go about doing that. And I think that, you know, if you ask nurses, many people in, who do this work look to the nurses that, we've, that have worked on this in this effort, and they say, you know something, nurses are heroes. And if you ask the nurses, they'll say, yeah, well, you know something, the real heroes are the mothers and the fathers who've gone through this, who've, gone, who've overcome terrible adversities to protect their children. One young mother who had been um, involved in the program was, um, uh, she was a teenager, she drank heavily, she, was, um, she had been tortured as a child. She had done terrible things to a child, she had, the children she babysat for. And she said to her nurse, you know something, I'm afraid that I'm going to do this to my own child. And that drive, in spite of all of these kinds of behavioral problems and uh, challenges in her life came through in the context of a caring, therapeutic, um, open relationship. That young mother, that nurse said, I love this, mother, this young mother. And the mother said, and I love my nurse. And it was enduring. And what, where does this come from? Where does this come from, this drive to protect our offspring. You know, Jay said this, I think, um, yesterday. There is something that all life um, characterizes life, and that is this drive to regenerate, to reproduce, to care for one's offspring. And that's a very, very powerful force that we think adds power to this intervention because we're activating it, supporting it, eliciting it. It's not always evident, but if you dig deeply enough and you listen carefully enough, it comes through. Uh, the nurses in this program have three major goals. The first is to help women improve the outcomes of pregnancy by helping them improve their prenatal health and the conditions, the environment, the context in which pregnancy is, evolved, is, is developing. The second is to help parents improve their children's health and development by helping them provide sensitive, responsive, developmentally stimulating, growth-promoting parenting in the first two years of the child's life. And the third is to help parents become more economically self-sufficient by thinking deeply about what they want for themselves and their children and how they might be able to continue their educations or find work or, most importantly in all of us, I think, plan the timing of subsequent pregnancies because the timing of subsequent pregnancies, closely spaced subsequent pregnancies, have a bearing on women's abilities to complete their educations and find work. And of course, that has an effect on the, if you want, the, the economic resources of the, of the family. Now, we're dealing with really impoverished groups. And so nurses systematically link families up with other needed health and treatment services in the community. But they also systematically involve fathers and grandmothers and sisters and friends in an effort to create a more cohesive and supportive family environment. And look, it's complicated. It's very complicated. You know, there are going to be situations where other members of that, uh, that network are not always oriented toward the protection of this child. And so nurses have to think deeply and, and, and adapt these home visit guidelines to the individual needs of each family. Here is the, if you want, the theoretical kind of overview of how the program is designed to work. By improving women's prenatal health, we expect to see improvements in pregnancy outcomes. We know, for example, that prenatal uh, uh, tobacco use 
increases the risk of preterm delivery and low birth weight, and also increases the risk of other su more subtle neurodevelopmental impairments, such as just newborn irritability. Babies born to women who smoke, this is taking just one substance, are more irritable and fussy. Well, what does that mean if you've got a, a vulnerable parent dealing with a, a, a fussy, vulnerable newborn? It increases the likelihood that that baby is going to be harmed. So the other part of this program, of course, is to especially reduce dysfunctional, harsh treatment of, of children, to promote growth-promoting um, caregiving. And th this is a, a, provides an, a, a, an illustration of the way these elements of the, the program design are, are designed to amplify one another to the extent that you've been able to reduce subtle neurodevelopmental impairments that lead to things like irritability and fussiness, um, it re makes it easier for parents to feel successful in the care of their children. So, um, and the other piece, as you can see here, is that, um, uh, and I've already mentioned, the promotion of maternal life course reduces the, uh, the likelihood the parents are going to rely, need to rely on uh, cash assistance, welfare, Medicaid, um, food stamps, because families become more economically self-sufficient and have fewer closely spaced ch uh, children that will, uh, in a way, stymie their abilities to uh, become economically self-sufficient. You know, if, you, if you're working at the counter in McDonald's and um, and you've had a baby, but you get pregnant soon after that, you're not going to be able to make an advancement to the, uh, the assistant manager position. But if you're able to postpone that subsequent pregnancy, you can start to gain traction in the workforce. And of course, all of these influences, especially the prenatal health and stress factors, are likely to have, we know, there's just, there are massive amounts of data, we've already been discussing this week, that those factors have a bearing on children's capacity for emotional and behavioral regulation, cognitive development, cognitive impairment. Um, some of these influences, though, are, sex, are, are, more, are more pronounced for different sexes. For example, there is now evidence from uh, cohort studies looking at the effects of uh, rocket attacks in the, West, in the West Bank or earthquakes that show the, that the effects of, of chronic stress experienced during pregnancy increase the likelihood of adrenal androgen activity and increase the rates of um, hormonally androgen-linked uh, outcomes, including uh, conduct disorder, including, um, including conduct disorder as well as later health impairments, such as cardiovascular disease. We see that the effects, and this is a study by Danny Shaw and uh, Kate Keenan um, conducted in Pittsburgh years ago, found that, that the effects of, um, of harsh treatment early in life increase the risk for physical aggression in toddlers, but, they, in, but only in females, not males. You see the same kind of thing in, in uh, cohort studies of women ex and ma males and females, large uh, cohort studies looking at the effects of, um, of early experiences of physical aggression. The effects of physical aggression are there on health for females, but not males. So there seems to be at least in some aspects of these early influences, greater sensitivity to these sources of early stress, whether they be prenatal stress or harsh treatment uh, for females, but not males. The effects on, on females seem to, uh, uh, again, activate um, adrenal androgen activities in making females more masculine-like. So it's important for us to the, um, keep some of these sex differences in mind as we think about early, early development. We've tested the program in a series of randomized clinical trials over the last 40 years. 
first in Elmira, New York, with a sample of primarily low-income whites. The sample was more heterogeneous in terms of risk. We focused on those who were low risk, but we allowed anyone in the community who was bearing a first child to register in the program in order to avoid creating a program that was stigmatized as being only for the poor or for uh, those with problems. And the effects were really quite promising. Um, and many people said to us at the time, gee, you got a program that works, you need to make it more widely available. We took the position that we ought not to do that because we needed to know whether these findings would replicate and especially whether they would replicate with minorities living in a major urban area. So we spent four years of raising money from nine funding sources to conduct a replication trial in Memphis, Tennessee, where we registered 1,100 families for the prenatal phase of the trial and 742 for the postnatal phase of the trial. And, um, and wanted to see whether the effects would be reproduced. And then more recently, people said, well, gee, you got a program that works, you not need to make it more widely available. And we, um, but they said to our team, but you know something, if you hired people from the community to do this work, you would be more effective because there would be reduced social distance. And you'd have greater effect and people would be more welcoming of, um, of families uh, of visitors into the home if they were um, people from the community rather than nurses. Well, I'm going to talk about the effects in just a moment, but what we found was that, in fact, families opened their doors more for nurses than for paraprofessional visitors. And we think that that's because women, pregnant women are concerned about physical health and care of the newborn, and it makes them more receptive to offers of help from the health uh, from the professionals who are, have the greatest trust in all, all of U.S. society, more than even attorneys. <laughs> now, these findings uh, represent the, um, um, those findings that replicate across at least two or three, uh, or um, two of the three trials we've conducted. There are significant effects, replicated effects on prenatal health such as reductions in prenatal tobacco use, reductions in hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. In our first trial, we measured diet and found reduction, improvement, improvements in diet, but we didn't, rep, we didn't repeat that measurement because it was time consuming and we saw no short-term effects on qualities of diet on functioning. We see uh, consistent effects on on children's injuries, and most importantly, serious injuries reflective of having, uh, children's having been abused or neglected, replicated effects on children's cognitive development and school readiness and, and academic achievement, but these effects are limited to children born to mothers who were more vulnerable by virtue of their having limited intellectual functioning, uh, higher rates of depression and anxiety, and limited sense of control over their life circumstances. These are the mothers who are least capable of coping with adversity. We see significant replicated effects on children's uh, behavioral problems at school entry, reductions in children's depression and anxiety early in adolescence, reductions in children's substance abuse across, or use, not abuse, use, early in adolescence, Reductions in maternal behavioral impairment do their own substance uh, use, Incre reductions in the rates of short interpregnancy intervals, improvements in maternal employment at least early in life, and reductions in welfare and food stamp use. Here's an example of a finding from our Elmira trial, we see significant reductions in preterm delivery among women who smoked five or more cigarettes per day at registration. And we see um, significant, re not significant, trends for reductions in the rates of um, uh, uh, child abuse and neglect based on official records in the first two years of the child's life. The yellow bars on these figures represent um, children whose mothers were visited during pregnancy alone. 
And what we see is that the effects of the program on the rates of state verified reports of child abuse and neglect were most pronounced where there was overlapping sociodemographic risks, being poor, being unmarried, and being teenaged. Now this difference was, was only a trend. It's one of the reasons we felt that we needed to look at longer term effects and replicated effects. And I need to say that in spite of the fact that we see these effects um, in Elmira um, based on um, official records, official records of child abuse and neglect are a lousy indicator of maltreatment for a whole host of reasons. One of them is that we, nurses and other providers are required by law, to, they're mandated to report maltreatment when they uh, suspect it. And nurses in the Elmira program, we, we formed a relationship with the child welfare system and said, we've got this condition, does this require a report? Not without revealing the identity of the, of the, um, uh, the mother. And there is evidence that nurse-visited families were identified for maltreatment, suspected maltreatment, at lower thresholds of severity than their counterparts in the control group. And when we think about the way child welfare systems today are overwhelmed, the use of this, it's a general principle, I would say, for these kinds of studies. We need to be very careful about the use of official records data of this type in particular, and figuring out the health or the experience of, of participants because they are subject to all kinds of influences on utilization or referrals that can affect the interpretation of data that we have. So this applies to healthcare utilization data as well. This effect that we saw in the Elmira program was more pronounced for those um, for those children born to mothers who had limited sense over their life circumstances. And this is important because the program itself is grounded in promoting self-efficacy by helping women establish small achievable objectives that they can accomplish between visits that will increase their sense of efficacy and their generalized sense of mastery in, in coping with adversity in their lives. And here we see that among those mothers who had limited efficacy, uh, sense of mastery, the rates of, of, of maltreatment were further intensified. And by age 15, we see that the, there is a significant intervention control difference in the rates of state verified reports of child abuse following uh, records of child abuse and neglect. Uh, from 13 states into which families moved over the first 15 years of the child's life. My thanks to my friend and colleague John Eckenrogat at Cornell for leading that follow-up work. And uh, these effects, even, uh, while they were a treatment main effect, were even more pronounced where there were overlapping uh, sociodemographic risks. Um, and one of the approaches that we've taken in this program of research is not only to understand who benefits most, but who benefits less so that we can use that information to guide efforts to improve the program and its implementation. This slide shows that the impact of the program on maltreatment over that first, the first 15 years of the child's life was attenuated in households where there were moderate to high levels of reported intimate partner violence. So that led us to set in motion a program of research aimed at addressing intimate partner violence, which I'll mention in, in, um, in just a while. Um, so it's important for us to keep this in mind. And by the way, you know, when nurses were visiting families, they, they, um, they would find fathers who were there who were some who were really engaged and wonderful. In other cases, they would feel uncomfortable because they felt that, that guys were controlling and watching every single thing their partner was saying. And they didn't, we didn't really have a, a deep appreciation for psychological control and intimate partner violence at the time we began this work. But nurses observed it and were wondering what was really going on. Um, 
among the mothers who were poor and unmarried at registration, we found a significant reduction in the rates of, of uh, self-reported arrests among uh, poor unmarried mothers 15 years after the birth of the first child. And a significant um, reduction by age 15, uh, 19 in the rates of arrests for um, youth uh, through age nine, 19. Uh, we had seen significant differences at age 15, but by 19, these differences in arrests were actually limited to females. Here we see um, a pattern of, of uh, self-reported offending that was not unlike what we heard about. We saw the patterns yesterday that, for example, Liz uh, Kaufman was, uh, was uh, talking about where we see these uh, increases in mid to late adolescence among males that kind of um, attenuate toward the, uh, as young people become, um, you know, they start to assume adult roles. But, um, but there was no effect among males. Why is that? What accounts for the fact that there were no beneficial effects on self-reported arrests? It could be self-report, because where there is evidence that nurse-visited children become more, there are, there are reductions in cognitive impairment, there's a reduction in their, if you want, their impulsivity, they have greater, uh, I'll show you in a moment, greater executive control. On the other hand, at the same time, mothers become more accurate reporters of their socially undesirable behavior, like prenatal tobacco use. We were able, in the Elmira trial, to compare the self-reported uh, prenatal tobacco use to uh, serum cotinine assays. Cotinine is a major nicotine metabolite. And we see that at the end of pregnancy, nurse-visited women were much more likely to accurately report their, their behavior, their, uh, their, their smoking behavior, than were their uh, counterparts in the control group. Counterparts in the control group were under-reporting their actual use, or nurse-visited women were more accurate reporters. So there is, it's complicated. And uh, I think that the, in general, the field has a huge problem in, in reliance on, say, self-report data. We're much better off where we have data that are relatively unequivocal in their interpretation. We need to keep this in mind, in my view at least. Um, our second trial was conducted in Memphis, and we concentrated on a, on a population, recruiting a population that was at concentrated um, uh, risk. Um, it was primarily African American, almost all Afri African American, almost all unmarried at registration. 85% of the families were living below the federal poverty guidelines. These families were living below, often below subsistence levels. Um, two thirds or so of the, the mothers were teenaged. The neighborhood conditions were among the worst in the, in the country. Almost two and a half standard deviations above the national mean in terms of neighborhood adversity. And we've been very successful in retaining the, um, the sample for follow-ups over time because there's very little mobility in this sample. We registered um, about 90%, by the way, of the eligible, eligible population coming through the um, uh, regional medical center prenatal clinics at the University of Tennessee. In the Memphis trial, um, there were four groups. Um, the two that, are, that we followed um, after delivery were group two that received, every, every one of our trials, let me just mention this, every one of the trials we've conducted, we've provided additional services to the, to the control groups because it's part, among other things, as part of our ethical responsibility to address the needs of the families we are working with. So the control group followed pro uh, prosenatally, which is treatment group two, was provided prenatal free prenatal transportation for regular prenatal care, and screening and referral services for the children whenever uh, those who were involved in conducting evaluations 
found problems that would warrant further evaluation and treatment. There was a group that was visited only during pregnancy and one postnatal visit, but we didn't follow those families after delivery. And then a group that received the transportation, the screening and referral, the prenatal home visitation, and the prenatal and postnatal home visitation, visitation through age two. Um, we see significant reductions in pregnancy-induced hypertension, which, by the way, I'm increasingly wondering whether is a reflection of a, the reduction in prenatal stress. I should point out that PIH, pregnancy-induced hypertension, is more frequently occurring uh, among women who are carrying female fetuses. Um, we see significant large reductions in the number of days that children are hospitalized with injuries in the first two years of life. This slide shows those children in the nurse visited condition who were hospitalized with injuries or ingestions in the first two years of life. You see here that one child was crawling on his grandmother's bed and picked up an iron and put it on his face when she was ironing. And two of the other children were crawling on the floor and picked up things and ingested them. Notice that all these children were 12 months of age or older, so they were mobile. Here's a corresponding list of diagnoses associated with the hospitalizations in the control group. 40% of these children are hospitalized before six months of age, so they were not crawling around and creating risk for themselves. Those children hospitalized early in life were hospitalized with serious conditions, such as um, fractured skulls, bilateral subdural hematomas, broken long bones, the kinds of conditions that are reflective of massively abusive care of children early in life when babies are most vulnerable. Um, and, and this is critical, these effects were limited to children born to mothers least capable of coping with adversity. These are the mothers in the lowest, the lower, this, this x-axis represents functioning of three major determinants, intellectual functioning, uh, and depression and anxiety, and, self, um, and mastery, self-efficacy. These effects were more pronounced among those mothers who had all three of these vulnerabilities. And they were limited to those, uh, those children born in the lower half of the distribution. It's important for us to keep that in mind, I think. Now, we also found, reported, um, uh, have found that the, um, that parents' report of, um, of children's uh, physical aggression, attacking others, hitting others, getting into fights, were significantly reduced at age two for nurse visited females compared to females in the control group, but not males. And, um, and there were, these effects did not endure uh, for either gender at age six and 12. Um, but what we did see is that in that, that subgroup that was defined by women's being, uh, children being in the lower half of the distribution for uh, women's psychological resources, that there was a significant reduction using the MacArthur story stem battery in dysregulated aggression revealed in their narratives. And we also see a significant you know, reduction in incoherent responses. The, the MacArthur story stem battery is where the, um, there, a, a little narrative, uh, the beginning part of the story is given to children, and then children are asked to finish the story. And those stories are then are coded, and these differences in, in, uh, in uh, dysregulated aggression and incoherence were more frequently occurring in the control group children born to those mothers who were most vulnerable. We see significant improvements in children's math achievement 
um, at age 12, uh, 12, but it's limited to those children born to the mothers who were most vulnerable. And by the way, these differences that we see, say, in math achievement, we didn't report this, but they're more pronounced for males than they are for females, but they cut across both genders. So, go figure. We see significant reductions in children's self-reported use of, of tobacco, alcohol, marijuana at age 12 in the, in, the, um, in the Memphis trial, and it's there for both males and females. And we see significant reductions in internalizing disorders. These are primarily depression and anxiety for both males and females at age 12. For the sample as a whole, irrespective of uh, psychological resources. And we see significant improvements, reductions in, in families' reliance on welfare, cash assistance, welfare, Medicaid, uh, food stamps over the first 12, um, 12 years of the, um, of the child's life. And maybe most critically, we see significant reductions in child mortality over the first two decades of the child's life for preventable causes. And for preventable causes, we mean sudden infant death syndrome, which at the time was almost, I was, um, how should we say this? More, um, uh, it's very likely due to maltreatment. And we see significant reductions in, in deaths due to injuries and homicide in the control group overall, none in the nurse visited group. These differences, we've looked for sex differences. They're there for both sexes. We see some differences for mothers, which I don't have time to go into. And um, we are in the midst of finalizing a report on, um, uh, from an 18-year follow-up where we have explicitly hypothesized, based on the Elmira trial, that we will see effects on self-reported arrests through age 18 for females, that the effects on self-reported arrests will be there for females, less so for males, and that, the, that we will see um, intervention effects most pronounced for those youth born to mothers who are most vulnerable at registration in language, math achievement, emotion recognition through facial recognition tasks, working memory, other indicators of neurocognitive uh, dysfunction, and that the effects are, in general, again, uh, hypothesized to be more pronounced for um, those who are born to more uh, vulnerable mothers. We're also hypothesizing that there will be corresponding reductions, uh, continued effects on substance use and use disorders, um, STIs, HIV risk, internalizing disorders, externalizing disorders, arrests, convictions, interpersonal violence. We're looking at a lot of stuff. And, um, and we're looking um, to find out the degree to which the, the Elmira findings for um, effects being limited to females replicate in our Memphis trial. This is the pattern of results that we see in our Denver trial. Effects were twice as large for uh, nurse-visited families than for paraprofessional-visited families. We see significant improvement reductions in prenatal uh, um, tobacco use, um, cotinine-based uh, uh, assessments, reductions in the rates of closely spaced uh, subsequent pregnancies with the paraprofessional group falling right in between the nurse visited and nurse and control groups. Significant uh, reductions uh, in language de delay at age 21 months for those children born to mothers with the lowest psychological resources. And um, the paraprofessional group falling right in between the two extremes, the, the control group and the nurse visited group. We see significant improvements in overall language functioning for those children born to the more vulnerable mothers. We see significant improvements in, a, in, a, in an index of, of uh, executive functioning at age four for those 
children born to mothers with lowest psychological resources. And we see at age um, two, four, six, nine, cross-sectional, cross, and by cross-sectional I mean cross-reporter and cross-time differences in the, in the reports using both parent report and teacher report in externalizing behaviors for females but not males. And these differences in, their, in the trajectories have to do with the females moving from extreme levels of externalizing behaviors into the intermediate category and from those who have very low levels of externalizing behavior into the intermediate categories. So exactly what this means, is it functional? Maybe. Um, but there were no effects for males. And this is based both on parent report and teacher report. So these findings, in spite of some of their, the questions, many of the questions we have, have led us to build what we think is a, um, uh, a rigorous system for US replication of the program, paying attention to things like community and organizational capacity, building your community and organizational capacity to replicate the program. We think excellent edu nurse education and consultation, detailed program guidelines that need to be adapted to the individual needs of families that nurses are visiting, an information system that allows us to monitor implementation of the program and to use that information for continuous quality improvement of the program. The program is now in 41 states serving close to 300,000 families now over the last 20 years or so. We've done, we're now working on international replication that involves um, careful adaptation to, of the program to new contexts, new populations, um, um, and, a, and, a, and support and promotion of independent randomized clinical trials of the program in new societies. We want to know in international replication that societies have the commitment and the capacity to replicate the program that the initial work uh, proves promising. And uh, for that reason, we've avoided going into very low-income countries so far. Um, we have taken very seriously this idea that the program will always be a work in progress. And so have we found in early replication of the program that, that the rates of participant retention in the program were lower than what we had uh, seen in the original trials. Why is that? Well, we did extensive work, including uh, uh, mixed methods analyses, quasi-experimental studies, a cluster-based randomized clinical trial of an effort to increase participant retention. We've, um, we've um, have invested in a well thought out uh, intervention for nurses to use in, in addressing intimate partner violence. The findings were published last week in JAMA and were disappointing. And um, part of it may have to do with the fact that there is evidence that the NFP actually does have an impact on intimate partner violence. There's, you know, there are a couple of studies that have found uh, reductions in intimate partner violence, so the, the bar is set fairly high. The question was whether we can, make, we can improve these impacts. Um, we've developed a new method for nurses to use in, in observing and supporting parent-child interaction called dance. We've, we are in the midst of conducting a, a, a cluster-based RCT to help nurses address more effectively depression and anxiety in the context of their home visits. Um, the point, I, we're in the midst of piloting and formatively developing a, a version of the program for women who've had previous live births or women who are um, at heightened view, a risk for opioid and other substance misuse. So um, there's a lot of work to do. And I think to ne I, we need to recognize that, um, that in some ways we can't do this alone, all of us are in this together. 
And I think that we need to pool our insights and, and think deeply about how we can address these problems, maybe especially vulnerable males. Um, there are, I think, I want to go back and look at the extent to which our, there's evidence, clear evidence based on observations of parent-child interaction, that we've improved sensitivity and responsiveness and reduced harsh treatment of children. But are nurses doing the best job they, they might in, in setting effective limits, especially for non-compliant males? I don't know the answer to that, but I think we have a responsibility to dig into that. And I also think that there are going to be children who are going to be, continue to be disruptive, and by age two, uh, we know that a lot is going on. We need to make sure that those children are linked with ongoing services, beginning at age two, to, um, to support parents and daycare providers in addressing the needs of this particular vulnerable group. Um, and our approach in all of this is to do careful, formative uh, development of interventions and to conduct small-scale trials to figure out whether we're on the right track, and then to put these ideas, these innovations, to more serious tests to see whether we can um, make this even better. And by working together. All right, well, thank you very much. <clears throat> you have 15 minutes for questions. Danny. Uh, great talk, David. You, you set the bar extremely high for the rest of us <laughs> and have for the last uh, 20 years. So um, it's interesting about the, the finding with the most vulnerable mothers. That's the one that, that caught my fans because we find very similar uh, effects uh, and mostly for those at greatest risk. And so you've done so much in terms of addressing the mechanics of the intervention, um, but I didn't hear you talk about making it less universal, I guess. And I was wondering, in times of you know, uh, high demand but low resources, when you're going into a new community in the next few years, would you consider if a, if a, 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 a city or a jurisdiction says, we can only do this, but we have to limit it to half of what you have in mind in terms of, because we have this whole population, would you consider uh, screening for those in most need in a, you know, a systematic way like that? So, Danny, thank you. I just failed to say what we actually are doing. Oh, and so, um, and it's challenging because when we first yeah. began this work, um, we were using Medicaid eligibility as the yeah. threshold for, for uh, participation. And what's happened, of course, in recent decades is that Medicaid eligibility has risen. When we began this work in Colorado, it was 133% of poverty. In California today, I think it's 300% of poverty. And, um, and uh, Iowa, I think it's about 300% of poverty. So we're dealing with much, uh, much uh, less poor family, many less poor families. And the rates of teen pregnancy have plummeted over the last few decades. So we need... Uh, those families who are enrolled in the program today, in general, using those indicators, are at lower risk. There may be other risks, higher risks like due to opioid and substance use and so forth. Um, we absolutely need to be targeting the intervention, and this is something that the, our, the NFP National Office is doing rigorously and thinking deeply about how to do this, but honestly, it's more of a challenge because some of the, these risk indicators are um, in very, are, are uh, not in, in a standard way available. You're doing, in Pittsburgh, really outstanding work in being able to characterize levels of risk in families who come in for health care today. Right, but but you, have your data, the, you have your data to use, though, right, on depression. You have your data to use on response to treatment, right? Yeah. For a screen, right? 
Yeah, theory, right? I mean, I don't know whether this. Yeah. Well, I, here's what here's what is going on and has been going yeah. on and for quite some time. Nurses have what we call the STAR framework, and it represents strengths and risk. And it's not simply an assessment tool, but it's a way for nurses to think about the families they're serving, to identify what we think are proximal risks, like substance use, or intimate partner violence, or uh, uh, parenting attitudes that are clearly associated with maltreatment. And then to distinguish them from things like poverty, or other kinds of more distal risks that are important, but not as proximal. And the, the idea is to, for nurses to be able to use that information to inform their clinical practice and to adjust the dosage of the program depending on risk. And, um, and um, that's a step in the right direction, I think. And it's, uh, and it's sensible because it really, and it relies on nurses' clinical judgment. But I think that we need to do a better job of working with providers who can inform local nursing teams about what they are most concerned about in this, this group that has a high preponderance of social determinants of compromised health and development. I, the point's very well taken. I just think that we collectively, really collectively, need to figure out how do we identify these most vulnerable families in an efficient way and engage them without making them feel um, that we are watching them. Very delicate. You know? Point. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm following up on, on the last question. I'd yeah, like yeah, to hear... I have a hearing problem, so oh, okay. I would be really grateful if you would yell. Okay. <laughs> Is that better? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, for th for first, thank you for a wonderful talk. And following up on the last question, I I'm curious to hear more of your thinking about why your effects were most successful, most pronounced with the families who were the most vulnerable and with the greatest overlapping risks, yeah. and how you think through that. Well, uh, there, are, there are probably two parts of this. You know, thank you for the question. Um, the, the, the most important issue, I think, is that there's greater room for improvement. All right? That's clear. And um, when we look at the kinds of risks we're addressing, whether it's, whether it's prenatal substance use or uh, toxic stress, if you want, in pregnancy, those factors tend to accumulate in populations where the mothers, let's say, are more depressed or anxious. They're more likely to, and, and even depression and anxiety is like to be a reflection of their not, of their, uh, or contribute to, they're not being able to cope well with the adversities that they're experiencing. So when we start to think of all of these things, mothers themselves who are reactive to their children's aversive cry signals are more likely to have been maltreated themselves or to have, if you want, subtle challenges with their own behavioral regulation that make it more difficult to, um, uh, to regulate their reactivity to negative stimuli for their, for their babies. So all of those things, the, the intervention is designed in some ways to reduce those particular risks for this segment of the population. The other piece that we need to keep in mind, though, is that from day one, nurses were visiting those more vulnerable families more frequently. The nurses came to me early on and said, you know, if we're gonna carry 20 to 25 families, we can't visit all of them following the specified program frequency. And my reaction was, well, just make sure that we do the best we can to, to visit those who are most vulnerable with the, the, do, the highest dosage that families can, can manage and, um, and go forth and do good work. There was no real guidance with, from, my, from our part about how to do that. Today, we have better guidance about how to do that. In any case, both of those things, I think, are likely to be playing a role. Yes, sir. In 2000, I put on a conference called The Paternal Instinct, 
I felt that there was a maternal instinct, which is what you're basically trying to activate here, activate the instincts to provide and protect uh, in the mothers. But I felt there were, there were corresponding instincts in men. And um, uh, I thought, men in your program, as you described it, uh, they didn't seem to enter in. And I thought, by inclusion of men in this, you're in including an underutilized resource. You know, when I uh, uh, think about reduction of maternal stress, one of the uh, very, very important elements of this is a supportive mate. Yep. If we want to reduce uh, uh, hypertension, uh, we can get... So that idea of uh, including the male, and you know, I was talking to one of the participants here yesterday and we were going over some of the uh, involvement of men in pregnancy. Uh, they almost seem to be uh, an outside factor, but the truth of the matter is, when a man's mate uh, becomes pregnant, uh, his testosterone levels go down, his oxytocin levels go, go up, and when they're working together, uh, this is, there's a mutual effect. So I am saying um, paternal instinct. <laughs> Somehow, if that could be included now as an element, would... Thank, I want to thank you for that because I agree with you entirely, uh, completely, and I actually wanted to say something about that, but forgot. So... Um, um, I, it's, it's complicated because sometimes fathers are not on the scene and uh, they are inconsistently involved. And the program is, there's a whole separate component of the program that's designed for dads. And so we are tuned into this. But I can tell you that it is complicated. It's complicated whether we're dealing with intimate partner violence, which adds a level of complexity to this. I agree with you entirely that there are wonderful fathers, and I have to say that my own biases were, uh, over the course of the years, were uh, um, addressed in some ways by having an opportunity to really get to know fathers who were part of the program, and they love it, and they, are, they can talk about attachment they can talk about the children's needs for security. And um, I'm, um, I'm moved by that. It's just more complicated. And I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you about that. David. Thank you for your, um, for your talk. I, have a, I want to follow up on something you said right at the end, that we can't do this alone. We need to pool our insights. Um, I think in the last 25 years, there's been a significant increase in the training uh, we are better evidence-based training for community health workers and paraprofessionals um, in the last quarter century since the, the, the Denver study was done. And that other, in really vulnerable communities such as the Latino immigrant community uh, here in Albuquerque, um, under, particularly under the current administration, um, are not open to interacting with people that represent potentially um, being on the public charge. So I think that there's room and potentially possibility for an interaction between the two programs, the paraprofessional program and the nurse family practitioner program, instead of pitting them against each other. How would you encourage policy or practice to do that? Yeah. Well, thank you for that comment. I, I think that we need to have a better understanding uh, of what those kinds of concerns are that families have with nurses. Because our experience is, um, has really um, not aligned with that. And I think that part of it, have, that the, the key point is that pregnant women are concerned about what does this back mean, pain mean? What does discharge mean? What is caring for my sick or vulnerable newborn going to be like? And so I... I do think that nurses bring health expertise to this particular point in human development, that is pregnancy and the newborn period, that families have a particular um, yearning for and resonance to. And I do think that as a community, we need to be thinking about how can we best um, um, deploy wonderful community 
health workers to contribute to this effort. Um, I'd, I, I would love to hear more about what you just said because um, if what you said really applies to broad segments of the population, then we need to be thinking about this together. So I, uh, I don't know the answer to this right now, but I do know that um, I do know the results from our, our, our Denver trial. So thank you for the question. Yes. Thank you for your presentation and the incredible work that you all do. Um, I have just a couple of questions. One is um, thinking about engaging the fathers more. Um, if you think it would be helpful to have male nurses go and maybe as a team with the female nurses and I know that adds tremendous expense. Okay, so let me just, uh, I'm, I, if you have several questions, yeah. let me just address that quickly. Okay, sure. What, what we have found is that often males, especially insecure males, feel, in, partners in the program feel um, in a way almost jealous of the, nurse, the mother's relationship with female nurses. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we can and should embrace male nurses. We do have male nurses delivering the program. But I think that they have a particular challenge in overcoming that sense of their sensitivity and their ability to form a caring relationship with this young mother can exacerbate some of those insecurities. I just need to, we need to be aware of that, I think. Your next question. I, we've got another question over here, too. So let's, um, I'm a worry okay. about my time. One minute. Okay. One minute. Okay, go, go to the other one. I, I already asked a question. Okay, so maybe we can talk later. Thanks. And Dr. Olds, thank you very much. Um, I'm honored to be, uh, we are the only nurse family partnership program in New Mexico. Um, I'm the nurse manager and we have a staff of uh, seven here in New Mexico. <laughs> and um, we are also part of the uh, uh, pilot Medicaid home visiting expansion project so that we are using Medicaid dollars um, to um, provide nurse family uh, home, home visiting to families in New Mexico. Um, we serve uh, solely only one county right now. Um, my question is, as what we hear, well, I, I do want to address a, a point about collaboration is that um, our program, um, our sister program is Parents as Teachers, so that we have consistent referrals back and forth of when our kiddos are graduating, our families are graduating at two years old, they are then referred to parents as teachers and um, they can be seen until they're five um, for the UNM parents as teachers program. So it's, it's a phenomenal collaboration to support those families prenatally to five years old. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. All right. All yes. Right. Beautiful. Yes. All right. And my, <laughs> my question is, um, there's been a struggle to expand nurse family partnership in New Mexico, the belief that it costs so much. Um, and so how, what are, what are the magic words to um, say to, to our state legislator, which, which they are, we are getting more and more dollars. Um, we're primarily funded by McVie, and then we are doing the Medicaid expansion now. But to look at the, the cost, the investment, and um, the costs, well, and, I would and say how important that I would just say that if, if, the, if the Nurse Family Partnership were to focus on those that are most vulnerable, that would be a, a good use of public resources. In our Denver trial, the paraprofessional program cost about two-thirds of the, the cost of the nurse visitation program. And so we just need to keep that in mind. Yeah. I wish, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess the, one of the questions really has to do with to what extent are, is there, are there replicable models elements that we can have some confidence they're going to produce enduring replicated effects on, um, on the population that we're most concerned about. Mm -hmm. And we specifically, our eligibility criteria is um, WIC, WIC eligibility, first time moms, and um, uh, living specifically in the county. But what we hear, we have a strong home visiting uh, programs uh, throughout the state of New Mexico. Yeah. We are the only NFP program, yeah. but throughout the state of New Mexico, um, most of our families are very, very high risk. Um, so that's, 
um, in New Mexico being 50th in overall child well-being, um, most of our families are high risk. To so begin we with. need to we need to dig into those data to 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 figure out what are the what are the most um, if again replicable characteristics of risk that we can use both here in New Mexico and elsewhere in focusing these scarce resources. Thank, thank you all very thank much. You.